until I leave, but <laughs> I'll come looking for you. Amen? That's, that's, uh, that's another promise you can have. I'll come looking for you. I won't let you go that easy. But um, anyway, thank the Lord for that. That was good. That was a, that was a blessing. Brother Luke. That's right. Yes. Mm hmm. Well, that's the difference in our ministry and a lot of online ministries. A lot of online ministries, you know, they'll take the tithes and the offerings and everything else, and they'll be happy just to do that, and they'll be happy to minister to people out there. But I'm a Baptist, and I believe people ought to be in church. I believe you ought to be a member of a local New Testament church, which, incidentally, Luke, is a perfect segue to my message tonight. So thank you. I'll pay you later for that, all right? Or you can pay me. I'm poor, remember? All right. <clears throat> anyway, you pray for my family. Pray for my wife. She's, I've got to, like, kind of force her to be off of her feet for another two or three weeks. She's supposed to be. Um, she, you know, there, there's a, a few complications that arose. That's why we had to go to the hospital. And there's some physical things that, and she needs to be strengthened. Her body needs rest, and it needs to be strengthened. So, you know, I, she wanted to be here tonight, and I told her no, pretty much. And she's probably not going to be here Sunday either. If so, it'll be for an hour. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, and, I, and I'm doing the same thing at home, too, because if I don't, she'll be up running around doing it, and she just really can't be. There's, there's just some complications there that things need to heal up and everything, and she just can't be doing a lot of moving around. And she's not supposed to be standing for long periods of time. She's not supposed to be, you know, kind of slumped over and like that. She's supposed to be kind of reclined back, laying mostly, sitting back in a reclined chair, and I guess eating bonbons. I don't know. but uh, <laughs> Or fat bombs. Uh, not bonbons, but we'll let her eat those. But anyway. But uh, no, but she's, what's that? Or cannolis. We did bring her back one of those from New York. Yeah, that was good. Hey, by the way, if you've never had one of those, you really need to have one. Anyway, um, they they were good. They were good. Anyway, but uh, so pray for her, please, that she'll get the rest that she needs and, and the healing. Uh, she's going to have to do some probably occupational therapy as well that she'll end up having to do for that. In s but it has to wait for six weeks because nothing can be done for six weeks. So she's got to wait through all that time and – Stay off her feet and rest, and so that all builds back up again stronger. So it's it's definitely a challenge, but I'm I'm kind of enforcing it more because I I know the seriousness of it that it, it's got to be that way. So anyway, um, we'll just keep praying that uh, that all goes well with that, and we'll trust the Lord and until until it's a good time to read and and to to learn and to. Do some of those things. So you use the time productively, but she needs to. And, uh, you know, she'll, she'll probably be here for an hour or two at a time and stuff, but she's going to have to make sure that she's reclined back and she's not putting pressure on, on her abdomen and all that stuff there. So it's just the way it is for now. But um, it's a miracle. I'll tell you, the Lord really worked that out. And I didn't quite understand it all right away, but I understood it better after it was explained to me. And it's just... Whew, just thank God there was an ambulance there, quick to get there, and those EMTs were there and and ready, you know. So it was a blessing for sure. Uh, we thank the Lord for that. God really answered our prayers when it comes to that, and we've been praying about that for a long time. So, all right, Acts chapter 14. Tonight we're going to finish out Acts chapter 14. And then we are going to, next week, Lord willing, we'll talk about that council. Boy, that'll be interesting. I don't know how long that'll be, but we'll talk about that. But tonight I want to talk to you about replacement ecclesiology in the Internet age. Because I, I title it that way because what we have today is an epidemic of replacement ecclesiology. Your people talk about replacement theology, right? They talk about, you know, replacing Israel or replacing Israel with the church or whatever. But I think there's something more dangerous than that. And I think it's what we're going to talk about tonight. And I want to show you that even the Apostle Paul did not do what men will do today when it comes to the Lord's church. Ecclesiology is what? It's the study of what? The church, right? 
It's the study of the church, okay? It's the theology of the church and, uh, you know, a, a, an ecclesia, a called out assembly, right? That's what we call ourselves. We know what that word means. It's a called out assembly. And that's what a local church is. And when I say local church, I say that for the sake of people that don't understand. We know that's the only one. That's the only one we believe in. It's the only one we believe we can see in the scriptures, except that one that will be in heaven where we'll all be together one day. Amen. In that one great church in heaven. But, uh, but as for right now, we believe that's that local New Testament church. And I want to show you how I thought it was amazing that the one thing that, that the Lord had stick out for me in this was that Paul, the Apostle Paul, he did he did not go around the church. He did not go around the local New Testament church. He, in fact, he honored the Lord's institution so much step by step along the way. Today, you have people. They've replaced the local church. They've replaced it with the Internet. They've replaced it with Bible studies. They've replaced it with uh, chat rooms and, and groups and, and Facebook pages and all that. And you don't find that in the Scriptures. You don't find that replacement ecclesiology. You don't find that in the Scriptures. But we see it today. We see it happening today. In fact, it was warned about in Hebrews chapter 10 not to do that. As the manner of some is. So there were some then. It's always happened. They tried to get around the local church. And we're going to read these verses here. Acts 14, 23 uh, through 27 here. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed throughout Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had reached the word, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down unto Attilia, into Attilia, and thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them, and how he had opened the door of faith. Under the Gentiles, and there they abode long time with the disciples. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray you'd help us as we see the importance of your church, Lord, and as wherever this goes, and as we strengthen ourselves here, and wherever this message goes, Lord, that others would understand the vital importance of your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, so many today wish to do away with the Lord's pillar and ground of the truth. His local church, they, they, they've traded it in for some universal invisible thing that has no authority, that has no membership, that has no um, accountability. You know, they, they've, traded that, they've traded that in. But the Apostle Paul, we don't see that. We see Paul uh, very concerned for the Lord's churches, very concerned for the methods and the way that he did things. The way that the Apostle Paul did things was always through the Lord's churches. He didn't go around them. He didn't supersede their authority. Even when he wrote them letters to instruct them, he never went over them. He admonished them through the church, but he never done away with it. You know, we do affirm and believe that there is only one church, and that is the local New Testament church. There may be places and assemblies that call themselves churches, and they may be assemblies, but they're not New Testament ones. There's a difference there. The Lord's churches are visible, called out assemblies of baptized believers that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been saved by the grace of Almighty God. They have coveted together to walk in the fear of the Lord. And they've been baptized and they've, and they, they've coveted together as members of that church. And that's what we believe the Lord has showed in the scriptures. And that's what the Lord instituted in Matthew chapter 16. That's what he, that's what he, uh, that's what he gave the ordinances. That's who he gave the ordinances to. He didn't give them to individuals. He gave them to his church. See, that's the problem today. You have everybody wanting to do whatever they want to do out there today, and nobody wants to follow the Lord and his churches. Well, number one, let me say this to you. We first see that there's an order set down. Paul sets down an order right, right away. God is a God of order, and he sets down that ordination, ordaining elders in every city, right? In every church, they are to ordain elders, and when they, ordained, when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, 
They commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. You know, Paul confirms those disciples who believed on Jesus Christ, and he warns them of the battles that are ahead that they would face for the faith of Christ. But Paul does not leave them without structure or order or discipline. No, he ordains elders in those, in those churches, and he, and he sets them up, and he ordains them, and he organizes them correctly as he goes through everything. God is a God of order. The disorder that goes on today and all of the, all of the, um, the disorder that goes on today, you know, they don't, you hear people say, I don't believe in organized church. Will you believe in disorganized then? Is that what you believe in, in disorganized church then? Yes. Right? Right. That is right. No accountability. That's, that's, that's the goal of that movement. But, you know, so many people today hate God's order. They'll run from it. They'll make false accusations against it. They'll attempt to do some type of end road around it. But God used his church. The church is rightly called the pillar and the ground of the truth. And there's no replacement for it. Satan still wars against the Lord's churches. Think about today how the governors of this earth want to stop churches from assembling. Why? Because Satan wants to stop them from assembling. Satan wants God's people not to assemble. Why? Because he knows when there's distance between God's people, there's coldness that comes. That's why he tries to create distance in your heart tonight. He wants me to say something that will make you mad. He wants, he wants you to hear something that you don't like to hear so you can go home and stew about it and think about how bad everything is. That's, that's what Satan's goal is. He wants you to use something so you can zero in on it so it will separate you so you can be devoured by the devil. That's what he wants. Because he knows he can never, he can never attack the Lord's churches head on. That's not how Satan works. He, he's like Amalek. He comes from behind to the weak and the feeble ones. And he attacks them some other way. That's right. That's how he operates. So if he can cause some kind of dissension, if he can get you to hear something the wrong way, or maybe I say something the wrong way, if he can do that just to get you offended enough so you'll do that. So you'll just be like, okay, all right, so-and-so did this to me, so now I have an excuse not to serve God, not to be faithful to the Lord's church. I'm telling you, that's how Satan operates. I don't know who I'm warning tonight, but I'm warning somebody. I'm going to tell you that right now. I'm warning somebody. You better be careful. You better check your ego at the door. Just go ahead and stomp on that bag of gas anyway, okay? Just go ahead and stomp on it. It ain't worth it. It, it just, it, it, it ain't worth it. Your ego ain't worth it. It just isn't. Just go ahead and stomp on that and get rid of it right now, and you'll, you'll do a lot better. Amen. Look, we, we see here today that, that they want to keep believers in, uh, of Christ apart. They want to keep them from being the church that the Lord made them to be. They don't want the Lord's people sitting as a church and serving as a church. They don't want a properly ordered church ordaining elders and, and in churches all over the place. That's what Paul did. He went through those churches. What's it say? And he ordained them elders in every church. Every church he went to. Every one. Right? They don't want that. Satan doesn't want that today. Most people don't want that today. Right? You see, Paul knew it wasn't enough for them to be saved. It wasn't enough for them to be baptized. It wasn't enough for them to be mere disciples of the faith once delivered unto the saints, they needed to be properly ordered and ordained in the church. They needed that structure and that order. They needed that discipline, just like you do. See, you have, to, you have to have a place where you come to and you fellowship with the saints of God and you're instructed, you're corrected in righteousness, that, you're, that, that your toes get stepped on, that you get rebuked, that you get edified and encouraged in the Lord so you can continue on to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. I'm going to tell you what, there isn't anybody in this room tonight that doesn't need to be encouraged sometime. And that's what the local church is for. That's why Paul did that. That's why Paul ordained elders in every city, and he had those elders in those churches, and he had those churches ordered properly and correctly. So you know what? There would be something. that You know what? Every person alive, every one of God's children need to be in a, need to be in a church. They need to be. There isn't one of God's saints that doesn't need to be in a church. They need to be in a church. They all do. And when they're not, they're not right with God. Now, some can't. I know there's, I've got people that listen to me in, in lockdown countries over in Croatia. They can't do anything. They're doing all they can do. And I understand that, and God does too. But God's going to do something about that. That's not going to last forever. If their heart wants to do something, God will do it. 
He will. Amen. Maybe I'll fly over there. I don't like traveling. <laughs> that doesn't mean I won't do it, though. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> but you know what? Where there, was, where there were rulers in the house of God, they, they're rules. And that's what's needed. You know, we, we, we live our lives after an orderly fashion. We don't live by, like, the world's rules. Like, the world doesn't have a problem lying to one another. Like, they can just do it and whatever. They can live their lives like that, and they can just be liars. They can say whatever they want. And it's uh, whatever. No big deal. Right? No big deal. It doesn't work that way for us. We, d- we don't get away with it. Why? I mean, that's why I'm, like, sitting on this plane. I'm thinking, Lord, I don't want to lie to you. I'm not going to lie, Lord. you got to do something for me, Lord, because I'm not going to lie. And what did he do? Remember when I taught you that on AW, what A.W. Pink said two weeks, three weeks ago when I taught you on that sermon that A.W. Pink said about Rahab that, that you should pray for God to make it so you don't have to do that and God is able to do that? Do you remember that? Because I do. It's stuck in my head and in my heart. And I was like, Lord, I'm going to ask you to do that. Amen. Amen. And I can tell you that he did it. Amen. That's how God works. But they needed to be properly ordained. Paul and Barnabas ordained those elders. Why? Because someone has to be in charge. There has to be leadership. And Paul knew that. You don't just leave a bunch of sheep out there without a shepherd wandering around. It doesn't work that well. Right? By the way, be careful that you don't try to, to, to be a member of this church and not be shepherd, shepherded. You know, to have a shepherd over you. And not to have guidance and direction when you need it. And think that, no, I got it all figured out. No, none of us do. <laughs> right? We, we, we all need help sometimes. Sometimes we just need help. There's no shame in that. The shame is when you don't ask for it when you need it. That can lead into a lot of shame. That will lead into a lot of guilt, and that will make you want to run. Amen. But God's people are not allowed just to run around with no authority. No leaders, no structure, no order, just claiming to love God but never willing to follow his instructions and his order that he had laid down. This is a most hated doctrine today. Right? They want to replace it. Haven't they? They've already done it. They've, they, see, Satan doesn't care. Look, and I, by the way, let me say this. There's been a lot of people that are saved from the online ministry. I absolutely agree with that. But that's an extension of Old Paz Baptist Church. That is a ministry of Old Paz Baptist Church. And they'll never get the effects of truly having a pastor until they're in that church. A church, somewhere, serving God, being faithful to God, being fully surrendered to the Lord. Amen. In his church. That's God's plan. But even Paul, in the infancy of these churches and the infancy of evangelism, Paul ordained elders in every church. He didn't leave it to where there was was no leadership, nothing. Paul didn't do that. Now, listen, there, this was an interesting thing right here because there were not seasoned and experienced converts at this point. So later, Paul would lay down the proper order in the pastoral epistles to Timothy and Titus. Turn there to Titus chapter 1, verse number 5. So I want you to understand something. The Holy Ghost of God led Paul to ordain these men. Were they as seasoned as they? No, because Paul hadn't laid that down yet. Later on, as Paul's in jail, he writes to Timothy and Titus, and he explains to them, okay, guys, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be a partaker of his evil deeds, right? So, um, you know, now I want, now these are the qualifications. Why? Because some time had passed. And the Holy Ghost did some amazing things right here. Will there ever be a time that that could happen again? Sure, I'm sure it could be. You never know. You could be in a country somewhere. You could be preaching the gospel. Many people get saved. Many people get baptized. And, the, and, and you got to leave and there's no order there for a church. What happens? I don't know, maybe God, by the Holy Ghost of God, he says, okay, ordain you elders. Here's their qualifications. Yes, this is what they need to follow. Could there be a time again? Sure. I I, I can't say there wouldn't be because I'm not there. If I was out in the middle of nowhere and they had no leadership and nothing else, you got to do something, right? So God leaves it. God get, And I'm going to talk about this in a little while. Let me explain a little bit later. Do, is that the norm, though? No. The norm is for a seasoned man or a man that, that has proven himself. Right? According to these qualifications, Titus chapter 1, verse number 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. 
If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. Not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Why? Because they got big, fat mouths that need to be shut. That's my version. but <laughs> Whose mouths must be stopped. It says, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. You've got to stop the mouths of the gainsayers. Sometimes you see me on the street, and you see me like a bullet go straight, be like, boom. And they, they, why? Because the Bible says you're supposed to stop their mouths. Right? Their mouths are to be stopped. Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Sound like the internet? Yeah, it does. The internet, that's what it sounds like today. You got, you got all these, te- a- any guy, any guy, especially if he's in his mom's basement, any guy can make a video, right? And, and <laughs> man, the, the, the pictures of all these people go through my brain when I'm thinking, the, the thoughts of all these men, just, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, not really. Right, monetized, and, and, and all, these, all these people coming through there, right? Have they proven themselves? No. What can they do? Spit a bunch of facts out. Then you find out they're a bunch of porn addicts and wicked perverts and devils and every other thing. Amen! I've seen it all, friend. It's exactly what you find out. But the Internet doesn't replace the church. It doesn't do a better job than God's plan. Amen? Just this week, uh, we were blessed with that testimony of Brother Zach's wedding, of that Brother Steve, you know, that that, uh, who listened to us for a long time, got himself into a local New Testament church, wanted to serve God and be faithful to God and raise his family there. Amen? He saw the need for that. He understood that he needed to be there. And that's why we do what we do. That all those that listen may find a church and serve God in that church. There's no replacement for the Lord's church. There isn't one. There isn't one. What you have here and the fellowship that you have here, don't you dare take it for granted. Don't you dare take it for granted that God, that that of what God has blessed us with and given us here. Because there's people that want it all over the country. People moving because they want it. There's no replacement for God's churches. There's no replacement. Ecclesiology, is there? Everyone needs to be faithful to their local church if they have one and serve God. It's God's plan. He ordered it. He ordained it. He shows a second witness of that later that, again, remember now, Paul is dealing with what he's dealing with right then and there. New converts, new churches planted. He's got to do something, right? But he said here in 1 Timothy, as he later on, he's going to lay down the order of how things are supposed to be. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wring their neck. Oh, wait, that's not. (laughs) Right? Not given to wine. No striker. What about a choker? Is that <laughs> that? <laughs> I did choke Dave once, but didn't I, Dave? I did poke your belly, but you ate a lot of pizza and cannolis, and I it just he was sticking it out with the cop belly, and I I I was a poker. Every time that every time you walked by me, I went, <laughs> and I just kept the whole time, I just kept going. I wanted to poke his dad's belly, but I knew he'd punch me. So I, I, I didn't. I, I don't know I'm good enough yet. Let me just wait. But I'll <laughs> oh, amen. We had a good time, though, didn't we? Vigilant, sober, of good behavior. Given that's good behavior, not poking somebody's belly, right? I gotta, be, I gotta work on that one. Given to hospitality, that was hospitable. That was <laughs> apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker. Not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, but 
not, not covetous, one that ruled well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Does that mean you don't drop them off buildings or with all gravity? Is that what that, tut, right? You don't drop them, right? Don't drop them off the playground set. With all gravity, that's true, with all gravity. There we go. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So God gives us this double witness to those qualifications of those elders. In our text, we see that God wants our churches to have pastors that train and that teach and train the people and build them up in their most holy faith. And if someone doesn't have a good local church, then they're an incomplete believer. They really are. They'll never be able to exercise their gifts, and their gifts will not be used to help others in the, in, the, in the church and to help themselves and to learn and edify from others. That's just the way that it is. If you think you can live a Christian, let me tell you something. If you think you can live the Christian life that God wants you to outside of his church, you're crazy. You're, you're, you're deceived, and you believe something that the Apostle Paul didn't believe or practice, which I'm going to show you. He didn't believe it, or he didn't, pra- and he didn't practice that way, right? You're not what God wants you to be in that sense, because God saved you to put you into his church and to serve God. Paul was an apostle, and he certainly could have just left those believers out there unorganized, right, disorganized, if that was God's will, but it wasn't. Paul knew he must give them leadership. They had to have structure. They had to have order. Those churches needed to be ordered correctly. And people need pastor today. They do. You need a pastor. You need a church, and you need people to serve God with. You absolutely do. Just this week, it was funny. Monday I got home, and, and, and it's a good thing because you got to understand, it's not good for me to have too much time to think sometimes. It just really isn't. But So I'm not complaining. I'm actually laugh- I'm smiling because that's how God does things for me. Like if I if I'm if I'm gonna set myself up for something, God's like, nope, I'll keep you busy. You won't be you won't have any time to do that, right? So I get home on Monday and I had like five different things going on at once, and I was like, wow, okay, and and but it was good. I I needed it. It was good, and but you know what? One thing I'm realizing more and more the longer I'm I pastor people is a lot of my duty is just to encourage you. That that's really what it is, you know. Although I do enjoy yelling at you, but but really, especially Dave, but but and Aaron, but um, right, Aaron, I do. I enjoy yelling at Aaron or pushing him in the street sometimes, but not when people are looking because that looks bad. But right, Aaron, right, but that's right. What's that? No cell phones. Oh, stop it. Anyway, <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> but you know we. You know, one thing that I've realized is a lot of it is encouragement. And, you know, there's something that the Lord has done in my heart over that over the last, and that's because he put me through a lot of sorrow. He allowed me to go through a lot of sorrow. And, and you really do start to realize that a lot of the ministry is not, it, it, there is that reproving, that rebuking, but there's that exhorting. And that sometimes, when, when, when you take a look at things, sometimes you just need to encourage people and exhort them to continue on in the faith. And to trust God that you'll get through this next, you'll get through this next bit of time. This too shall pass. You'll get through it. God will strengthen you. And that's something that God has taught me that that I need to give to others. And that Hoggard, I've told you this before, that Pastor Hoggard told me that that one of the things he said, your healing will come through helping others. And he was right, and it does. When I'm not focused on myself and I'm focused on helping others and, and, and ministering to them and, and, and helping them through life. And that's really what it's about. it's about. It's about leading those sheep over the finish line. It's really what it is. That's a lot of what pastoring is, is leading them over the finish line, helping them to get to see where they need to be. You know, again, I heard some great testimonies this weekend I've shared with you of those families reconciled and revived, walking in the fear of the Lord, and that's encouraging, you know. But you you need encouraged, too. You also need, you need to be in church because God commanded you to be. 
That's another thing that we see here, the importance of the local church. It's that God commanded it. If God ordained it and God set it in motion, right, then you need it. And you're to follow it. And that's the same thing that, that, as far as a pastor goes. God gave you a pastor because you need one. He gives elders because you need them. Right? And he gave us one another because we need to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Right? Now, I want to I, I exhort some of you uh, and you that are older in the faith that have been around a lot longer that I, I, I want you to be looking out and seeing who you can encourage. I, I want you to be looking out and seeing that it's not just me that encourages people, but it's you that have the duty to encourage one another, to give yourselves in that sense to bear one another's burdens. I thought about this when... You know, when Brother Zach left and Brother Dave invested a lot of time in Brother Zach and spent a lot of time with him and loved him and cared for him and, 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 and kind of mentored him in a lot of ways of things that he didn't know and was a friend to him. And so was Brother Scott. And, that, and you know what? You got to see, they got to see the other side of that. You know, that sometimes you think, well, they're gone. You know, these people are gone. But you know what? Um, they're not gone. They're, they're serving the Lord somewhere else, and they're living faithful to God, and that's the way that it's, that's the way we have to look at it. And you'll be encouraged when you look at things in that way. Imagine if you're selfish and you don't do that, how much you lose. Listen, you better settle in your heart now as a child of God that you'd rather be hurt a thousand times over than never love somebody. Because you'll never live if you don't love I'm going to say that to you again, and I want you, to, I want you to clean the spiritual wax out of your ears and listen to me. You will never live until you learn to love. You won't. And unfortunately, part of loving people is getting hurt. It is a given. It will happen. I, according to the scriptures, will promise you, you will be hurt. But you'll also live life to its fullest. But some of you... Some of you may shortchange yourself out of life because you're not willing to give yourself to others. You're not willing to love. And you'll never get over your fear until you give love. Never. Never. You'll never get over that fear until you learn to love and give your heart to people. Amen. See, God commanded it, and you and I need it. It's just like the command to be filled with the Spirit. I need it because God commanded it. The why and the what for will be explained later to me, but I need it. Right? I, it's interesting to me. That, you know, there are some times that you just need to obey God and leave the where and the why and the what for up to the Lord. Let me give you an example of, of that. Uh, just just a, a temporal example, I should say. When my wife was was in labor and things were not going well, you know, I, I had a decision to make, right? Either, and, and I looked over at the midwife and, and she explained to me what, what she thought and what she wanted me to do. And I could have sat there and I could have argued with her and I could have tried to reason it another way and I could have done all that other stuff. But I also could have been burying two people. Right? So you know what? Sometimes it's time to just obey the instructions that you're given and trust that and just move on. Right? And just wait. Because God's not going to reveal to you everything right away. But he will later. You'll understand it better by and by. He'll explain it to you. But your duty and I, my duty is to be obedient. And God has given you a, th a ruler's over you. He's given you authority. He's given a structure, and you and I ought to follow it. Our churches today so badly need pastors that are engaged in the work that God has called them to do and not distracted. And I thank God that God has enabled me uh, to be provided for, that I don't have to look to other things and be distracted by other things. I thank God for that. I thank God that he's used you all to do that, and he's used others uh, online and other people that, have, that, that, that see the importance of that and that want to see 
me not distracted or, or anything else, but focused on what God has called me to do. Because the better that's done, the better it'll be for you and I. Amen. That's exactly where my, my mind and heart needs to be. You know, so anyway. Um, next, let's go to this. Uh, Paul, by the way, Paul knew there was no replacement for, for the church. Uh, you'll notice next that the church was to fast and pray. You know, there's another example of why we need the Lord's churches. And you can pray on your own. And you should. And shame on you if you're not. And you can ask others to pray for you. But God ordained that the church would be an institution of prayer. Amen. That, that, that he would shake the heavens and the earth through the church's prayer. These people that are out there all, all by themselves, right, and, and they don't have churches and they're not submitted to the Lord and they're not in those churches, and submit, they, they don't have what you have. They don't have that prayer. You know, well, you guys had a prayer meeting last week, right? Yes, was that last Sunday afternoon? Right? So we shouldn't be surprised that all those things fell into place for us, right? Say, but pastor, maybe we weren't praying for exactly. That don't matter. You were praying. See, God hears his people's prayers. And you know not what to pray. Right? But God's spirit does. And God's spirit leads his church. God's order was for the church to pray and to fast for these, for these elders before they sent them out. You know, so many want to go it alone today and say, well, I can pray, and well, you should. But when the, when the church prays, God moves. Look at Acts 4.31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Isn't that what you want? You don't want a preacher with no teeth. Amen? Unless they're false ones that are really glued and stuck really good, but otherwise they're going to fly out at you. But, but you don't want a dumb, do dumb dog that won't bark, right? So you pray for boldness. Acts chapter 2, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were all together in one accord. God uses the church's prayers and the church's fasting. Right? He uses corporate prayer. That's why we do it. No doubt, you know, God uses that. And we've prayed for people to be saved, and we've seen them saved. Right? We've seen people get right with God. We've seen people's health conditions improve. Right? Right? We've prayed and seen babies uh, born safely and lives spared from sudden death and safety given and financial needs met through fasting and through prayer. You know, there's something soothing about looking at a member and telling them I'm praying for you and for your family to be saved and for their spiritual well-being. Right? Something good about that. To know that somebody's praying for you, that the church is praying for your family. That's God's way. People that are by themselves, they don't have that. They, they don't, and they need it, and they don't even know how bad they need it. That's what's so sad about it. I feel very sorry for people who, do not have, who don't have that or who don't want that. I know there's some that, that don't have it that really do want it. But for those who do have the opportunity, it should be of the utmost importance as, if, as it was for Paul. You don't have the intimate spiritual fellowship with a Bible study or some online chat room or group. You just don't. I'm very close to people that I try to minister to online, and I love them. I, I really do as much as I can. But it's not like what we have here. It's not the same thing. And I hope they have that someday. I really do. Maybe the Lord will let us be a part of helping them get that. Amen. But there's no replacement for God's churches. None whatsoever. And next you'll notice that God gave them form and freedom. This was something that David Cloud said that I thought was interesting. He, he, all churches are not, the sa are, are not the same. Right? They're different. The number of people in leadership or the timing of how long we must wait to ordain someone, it's not the same and was not given to us. 
There wasn't an exact amount of years. With the world, it's like, or with the church, corporate churches, it's like, well, you have four years of Bible college, and then you get ordained and whatever. Well, that's their formula. That's not God's formula. God didn't say that. There's going to be different situations, right? Different things that arise. Not all churches are the same. Some have unique challenges. God gave us a form to follow, but he also gave us liberty and freedom within that form. Do you notice how God didn't say how many how you're supposed to structure this and how you're supposed to structure that exactly and how many people you're supposed to have or 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 whether you should have an assistant pastor or whether you should have God didn't say any of that really. He didn't say the number of deacons that a church should have or if they had to have any at all. He just said, if you ordain a deacon, this is what they're supposed to be. Right? And then we didn't see deacons in the church until there were a lot of people in those churches when necessity grew that there should be that. And that's what many believe is the case with that. Right? You know, not all churches are the same. Uh, some, some may not be able to donate much to their pastor, give to much to their pastor. And he may have to work a secular job like I did for five years. Right? As the Lord led. Until the Lord showed us the right time as a church. Some may be able to give more and start out that way. Some may have uh, many deacons or some may not need deacons until there's a necessity for it. There's a liberty, there's a, there's a form to follow, but freedom in how we reach such things. Not every church plant is going to be exactly the same. I guarantee you the way this church was, was founded and started, sent out a local New Testament church, some of the ways that things were done would not be, we would not do again. There's some that we tried to start that we would never do again the way that we did before. Right? That's, there's a form and then there's freedom within that form. God gives us the form, then he gives us freedom within that. Right? He says, you know, it must be a man, Right? Must be a, the bishop must be the husband of one wife. That's pretty clear. That's, that's part of the form, right? Um, but but there's, there's other things that, that God gives us liberty to do. And uh, it, it shows the difference in the complexity of different situations that, that will arise. Different areas of the world, remote areas, you know, other things like that that would change things, would make it different, Right? So that's the way, that's the way that, uh, that God does it there with that sometimes. Uh, timing of such things are left up to those who are in leadership, you know, to, to seek. We must not think that every church or every situation is the same because they're not. They're not the same. Uh, number four, the church commended them to the Lord. Paul commended them to the Lord. It says here in verse number 23, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. You know, this is, this is one of the hardest things about ministry, is to commend them to the Lord. <laughs> Notice they didn't commend them to men, but to the Lord. Remember, they kept pointing them to Jesus Christ. We're not to exalt ourselves. We're not to be some great leaders or great people and all that in that sense. We're to be crucified with Christ. Church leaders must point men to Christ. That's what we do. We don't point them to the cult of personality, but we, 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 uh, we point them to Jesus Christ, right? There is no right personality in that sense to pastor a church. There's going to be men that, that, that we will ordain from this church, that we will send out. They, they won't be like me in a lot of ways. They don't have to be. They just have to be faithful to God, not to me, right? They need to be faithful to the Lord. They need to follow the Lord. They're not going to, I don't expect anybody to be a carbon copy of me. Amen. What a hot mess that would be, right? I'll need another one. One's enough. But notice that they, that they commended them uh, to the Lord. John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. And that if you lift him up, he'll draw all men unto him. That Christ would have the preeminence. If it is built on Christ, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If it's built on personalities or man-made philosophies, it will crumble in the garbage heap of history. The only way to truly confirm the souls of men is to point them to the one who saved them and keeps them. My, my duty as a pastor is to always to, to get you to th hunger and thirst after righteousness, to hunger and thirst after Christ, to always go to him and seek him for your stability, for your strength, for your assurance. 
for your growing in grace and the knowledge. The same Christ that saved you is the same one that sustained you. There is, there is, there is salvatory grace, but there is ser- service grace. There is grace for service as well, and that you need that daily service. You need that grace for service every day of your life. You need that, that abiding and sustaining grace of God that you need to always be thirsting and hungering after. Amen? Um, that pastor talked about that out in New York. I thought that was a great sermon that he preached about that. He talked about, um, what's his name again? Pastor Cisco. Nice man. Uh, very kind man. Good preacher. Bible preacher. Loves the Lord. Did, preached some good expository messages, both the Sunday school message and that. Uh, and and just just good, uh, kind man, and uh, very very gracious. Um, and uh, anyway, but he talked about serving the Lord and hungering and thirsting after Christ always, right? And and that that's what we needed to do. We always need to you know we always need to get the and how to get the most out of church and everything. It was just it was really good, the, right? Being spent on Christ, you could be spent you could be spent on everything else, even ministry. You could spend yourself and not and realize that you're not. You're not you're not buying gold tried in the fire from Christ. That you're not anointing your eyes with with that salve from Christ, so you can see and everything else like that. So what a, it was a very good message. They committed them. That's what it means to commend them. Is to charge them. They commended them to Christ. You know what? After we lead men to the Lord, and and after and, and even in our church, one of the one of the most difficult things to do as a pastor is really to realize that you only have so much you can do. And you have to commend them to the Lord. You've got to give them to God. You've got to charge them, uh, g- charge them unto God, and 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 give them and give them over to Him, and say, Lord, well, there's none. Same thing with you as a mother or father. You've got to look at your children, and you know what? There's only so much you can do, and then you're going to have to say, I'm going to do all I can do, but you know what, Lord? I'm just going to commend them to you. I'm commended them to you, Lord, because there's nothing I can do. Please do something, Lord, because I've tried everything. Amen. You know, and, and sometimes that's what you and I have to do. They're in your hands, God. Please keep them. The same idea as this. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Amen. He commended his spirit. Right? Committed it to the charge of God. That's what you and I have to do. Amen. In ministry, we have to do that with people, especially people that you have to part ways with and let go. You know, like Brother Zach, you know, they just, just got to give them over to the Lord. Okay, Lord, they're your people. They're not mine. That's one thing I said to that pastor out there. I said, you know, um, at the end of the day, they're God's people. They're not ours. We don't get to keep them. We don't get to keep them all. They're God's people. He'll do with them what he wants. Right? And I said, that's just all that is is a precursor to someday when these young men rise up and young women rise up and God calls them into the service of the king somewhere and they go off and preach the gospel and, and, uh, and start churches and do all those things. We're going to be letting a lot of them go. They're not all going to stay, Mom and Dad. I hate to break it to you, but they're not. Some of them are going to rise up and go serve the Lord somewhere. They're going to actually believe the things that we say to them. They're going to actually follow them, and you're going to have to let them go. And I beg you in Christ's name, do not stand in their way. Do not discourage them. If God has called them to do that, don't stand in their way. Don't do that. You encourage them. You don't, don't, don't uh, project that onto them and try to talk them into it, you know, but don't, don't try to talk them out of it. Don't try to talk them out of it, right? Don't do that. If, God's, if God deals with them and, and God wants them in ministry somewhere and God does that, then they've got to go. God will show us, right? And we'll all be weeping together, amen? But there'll be a lot of tears of joy, too. Amen? You'd rather have them in the service of the king than in the service of sin, wouldn't you? I'll tell you what, you could hold on to one of them and, 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 uh, and, and their life could be a castaway and they could break your heart into sin and wickedness. All because you were selfish. Think about that. I don't know why I'm saying that right now, but we'll figure it out someday, right? Amen? That's right. Amen. That'd be Ezra. We're going to ship him out early, I'm telling you. We're getting him out early. Like next week, he's gone, man. I am sending him to Alaska. That's it. I'll even send Charlie with you, all right? You are going, brother. You are called. He probably gonna be these boys. I'm gonna tell you what some of these some of these little rascals they're gonna they're gonna go somewhere for the Lord. I believe it, man. 
I'm telling you, they got that feistiness in them. They need that. Amen? They need that, don't they? Right? Look at him laughing. <laughs> right. Watch this at the end here. They go back to their sending church. You see, Paul doesn't go around his church. He doesn't go some other way. Paul goes back to his sending church. He goes back to Antioch. Do you find that interesting? I do. Wait, it's the Apostle Paul. I mean, he's the apostle of the Gentiles. I mean, he saw Jesus Christ. What's he got to go back to Antioch for, right? Because that was his sending church. Remember Paul? Remember Paul didn't even go out and do the ministry until he was ordained and sent out from where? Antioch. So the apostle Paul does it, but people today don't? They don't believe in doing that? They don't believe in being ordained? They don't believe in churches starting correctly? But Paul did? Right? They're not skipping their sending church. Right? Paul didn't say, well, hey, I'm the Apostle Paul. I can do what I want. He didn't do that, did he? He, he, he you know, did he have to go back? I mean, come on, he's Paul, right? He, can, he saw Jesus Christ. He's done miracles. He did many wonderful things, right, that he saw. But he goes back to his sending church where he was ordained. Paul doesn't skip out on a local church. He's not some modern-day Lone Ranger. The apostle to the Gentiles was an example to us, and he goes back to his sending church and then sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. You know what? That's why God used him too, by the way, because he knew Paul was obedient. And he's going to, and, and Paul, it says here that they were recommended. What does that mean? They were recommended by the church, so they, uh, they were recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled from whence they had been recommended. What, what, what happened? Wait a minute. Recommended? They were, rec right, they were sent out. That's what that means. So they were recommended. They laid hands on them, recommended them by the grace of God for the work that they had called them to do. Guess why it was successful? That's why. Because it was God's way. Right? By the way, Paul never pastored uh, a mega church. You understand that, right? There is nothing recorded in Scripture that Paul had 3,000 people saved like at Pentecost. You understand that? What was Paul? He was faithful. The Bible says, that, and Paul says very clearly, and I labored more abundantly than they all. He didn't say he had more people saved than them, did he? He didn't say he was more successful than them. No, he never said that. He didn't say that. No, what he said was, I labored more abundantly than they all. Paul didn't lay the ground. Paul didn't stick around the Jews and... and Converts saved like Peter did. And God bless Peter. He did what God wanted him to do. I'm not putting that down. What I'm saying is, though, that Paul was the example to go into all the world, and he labored more abundantly than they all. But he never pastored a mega church. The Bible, I mean, what happened to Paul? He got beat up all the time. Made people mad. Got beat down. Thrown naked in the water three or four times. Got stoned. Got shipwrecked. Thrice was I beaten with rods, right? Cat of nine tails a couple times. Starving, hungry, cold, naked, thirsty, thrown in prison. What did he say? I labored more abundantly than they all. And what did he do? He went back to that local church and he said, here's my report. Here's what's happened. Praise the Lord. Right? They didn't get puffed up. Paul didn't decide to ignore his church or the order of God that had laid down. No, he followed it. Isn't it interesting that today most believers are professing once today see little importance in the local church? How about this? You have all these ministries that are outside of the church. You got newspapers and you got arcs and creation museums and book ministries and, and, and evangelists and organizations and prison ministries and, and, and traveling preachers and all these and street preachers, rogue street preachers. Right? And what are they all outside of the local church? No authority, no correction, no instruction, no accountability. Exactly. But that's not what Paul did. 
Paul spoke of the local church in love, and he wrote his epistles to those churches. And he tried to admonish them and, and correct them and instruct them and give them the care that they needed. He didn't go around them. And he never went around them even in Corinth. When, we, when we're doing, by the way, I got seven of my verses memorized. I got to get six more. But don't worry, I'm going to get them. Praise God, I'm going to get them. You're laughing. You, do you already have them all memorized? You don't. I'm going to beat these kids. I'm going to win. Amen. That's right, he did. He didn't try to go around him in Revelation. He wrote to the seven churches that were there. Yeah, he did. And he gave his instructions to them. Why? Because he knew they were going to be there. Amen. Perpetuity, right? You know, you have all these ministries today that are outside of that, though. You know, I recently watched over the course of the last three years, one of these men get puffed up with so much pride, one of these street preachers. And I don't know what's true or what's not true about it. All I know is that he got arrested for pepper spraying his wife. Did you see that? Oh, my. Pepper spraying his wife. I guess he got into physical altercations with her. He said he maced her a couple times or pepper sprayed her a couple times when she <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. When she wasn't being submissive or something, I don't know, or obedient. I was like, amen, brother. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. No, but I, I don't I can't even fathom how you go from marrying this lady and you actually I, I can't even imagine first of all. I don't I can't imagine pepper spraying anybody that I cared for, period. Right? Let alone your own your own flesh and blood, your wife, right? That's your one flesh. Like I can't even I, I can't even imagine doing that. Like I can't imagine anything that would make me look at my wife and be like, oh yeah? I I just I I can't I just I just, I try, I, I mean, I don't want to try to imagine that because that's not good, but, but I just, I can't imagine that. <laughs> I said miracle whip, not mayo. I mean, I, I just, I can't. <laughs> I, and let alone be a preacher and that have, but I, in all fairness, I, I don't. I don't know that I'm not mentioning any names and I don't know the whole story, but enough of it that is out there looks bad. And but it maybe it's not true. And maybe she's like this Queen Jezebel or something like that. But I mean, the pl he did admit to the police that he did do that. Right. It's what it said in the article. And he was arrested. Well, only when she didn't do what she was supposed to do. <laughs> and I guess the child. The kid might have got pepper sprayed, too. Is that what it said? Like the kid got pepper sprayed, too, or something? Exposed to it, whatever that means. I don't know. Probably, you know. And, yeah, like, yeah, because it, right? Like that one girly boy that sprayed you. Candy boy. He missed you and got Aaron because Aaron was a sitting target. That was charity for your brother right there. No, I'm just kidding. But, but anyway, so that. I, I say all that because here's this, and I watched, like, the puffed up, I, I watched it, like, rise over the last three years, and I was like, man, that ain't good. I think something bad's going to happen there. And it did. And it's it's sad. Now, this guy was former military, so I'm wondering if PTSD and a few other things are involved with that, because that, it warps the brain. That's not an excuse to do something wrong, but I'm just telling you, it does, they, it's, it's bad. It messes with people's minds, something fierce. But you know what? I wonder if he had a pastor, if he had a church that could could have helped him with that before he got that far. If he had some accountability. And I've seen Lone Rangers, street preachers out there get discouraged, get abused. I've seen them rebel and their life get worse and they have poor testimonies and all kinds of bad things happen. Other ministries out there, you know, whatever they may be, even Bible printing ministries, creation ministries, whatever, a number of different ministries out there, not of the local New Testament church, and really no authority exists in the perpetuity or anything like that. They don't have that promise. You know, I think of the sword of the Lord and all those others that build up empires uh, of things and sell their papers everywhere, and they're the big-name preachers, and they're all traveling around. They're not, oh, they have a board of churches that, 
yeah, right, whatever, Shelton Smith does what he wants. If you don't think Shelton Smith does what he wants, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, but you just don't realize how fundamentalism works. That guy does what he wants. That board don't tell him to do nothing, okay, whatever. I read they all slap each other on the back, whatever. It's like a deacon's meeting at a fundamental church. The deacons don't really do anything, especially when the pastors handpicked everybody. Anyway, I've seen it all, believe me. Um, it <laughs> What's that? There's no board of churches in the Bible. That's correct. So, I mean, you know, I, I've seen it all. I've seen their empires, their Christian schools, their colleges that are not – you know, in Pensacola, there's one – what is that uh, – uh, what's that one called there? Campus Church is ran by the college. The college orders the church what to do. No, I'm not kidding you. That's how it is. And actually, Baptists actually send their kids there. Yeah. PCC, is that what it is? Seriously. And I'm like, well, why would you do that? And, like, what's that pastor do when, like, the college president tells him what to do? Like, how does that work? Like, why would you ever pastor a church like that? if Because I'd be like, I'll do what I want. Get out of here, you little runt. Get your little pencil neck back. Get your little pencil neck back to the college. Don't be telling me what to do. Get out of here, you little runt. Right? And then what would you do, fire me? And then I'd start one right across the street. <laughs> right, he's got authority over the pastor. That's the way it is. Probably some board has authority over that. What a joke. How embarrassing. For, for, I, I, look, I can't believe pastors actually send people to those places. It's just ridiculous. But marvel this, though, that they do, they do what the Apostle Paul does not do, did not do. Paul never did any of that. Paul did everything through the local church. If Paul took himself back to his church and all his church planting work and evangelism, healing and miracles and all that work was sanctioned by the Lord's church, what gives men the right today to do what they do outside of his church? Answer, it's their own pride. Right? They start churches or falsely so-called without ordination, without church planting, churches planting churches without any order at all. They don't find the Apostle Paul doing that. They find him following God's order, right? That, that a man's ordained and then sent out to do that work. The Bible says, and when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. God bless Paul's work. What was, Paul was obedient. There is no replacement for, for the church. There's no replacement ecclesiology. There's, no, there's, there's nothing that you can replace the church. You know, people are so worried about replacement theology, and I don't like it, and I don't agree with it. But I'm going to tell you something right now. The more dangerous thing is, is the replacement of the church. Because they, they, they literally have these ministries out there that are replacing the Lord's churches. That's what they're doing. Right. That's outside of God's plan. And uh, anyway, so... Um, we finish Acts chapter 14 here, and we'll pick up Acts chapter 15. This will be an interesting one. I believe this is that council, I think, and it, it'll be good. I think that's what it is. Maybe. Maybe we're not quite there yet. Oh, yep, we are. Okay, it'll be Acts 15. This will be interesting. That's right. Man, that woman was talking in church. Did you see her? Wow. Next thing you know, she'll be running the aisles. With her hands up in the air going like this. And, right? <laughs> Not to get the pepper spray out. That's right. Anyway, let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your church. And thank you, Lord, that we have one and that you've given it to us, Lord, and help us to cherish what you've given us. And, Lord, we thank you for your people. Help us all to love one another. Help us to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Help us to be an encouragement one to another. Please be with Brother Paul as he's out working. And just take care of him. Be with Hannah as she's home. Be with others, Lord. And, and heal them and raise them up and strengthen our hearts and our lives. Thank you so much for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.